And today is part three of our program about the human and the city, because, you know, there is no city without humans who change this city, who make it different, who make it shake, who make it tickle and do other strange things after which the city is nothing like before. And tomorrow at 8 o'clock, am I right? 8 o'clock, yes. We'll have a small discussion in which eight panelists are going to take part. These are people managing different city building projects, core projects for cities, including the artist Andrei Bartenev and our today's speaker and the manager of Art Play, which has changed Moscow's experience a lot and representatives from the city of Yaroslavl and uh, people who worked on the Sochi Olympics and a lot of other interesting speakers do visit us today, uh, tomorrow as well. And maybe we will know what an individual really has to do to make a city different. But today we're going to highlight two cases. My old friend is going to tell you about his job. We became friends a lot of years ago uh, when he was the director of Watermill Center, which is an important artistic center close by New York. It was founded and led by Bob Wilson, the great artist and director. And Jorn, my friend, uh, has worked for a long time as a director for a lot of projects uh, under the head of Robert Wilson. So he worked there and then he was uh, headhunted by the Illuminato Festival in Toronto, uh, which he has led for five years, and this must have been one of the greatest experiences in his life, because the city was growing, the festival was growing, and it all was changing while Jörn Weisberg was at the helm. And now the last year uh, he has moved to Los Angeles, where he is the artistic director of uh, the Music Center LA, uh, which is uh, analogous to New York's Lincoln Center. You may have heard about it, and now Jorn is going to tell you all about this all. And I think it's really important to start this discussion about the way in which culture and urbanistic knowledge change cities, change the world, and that's what he does. Thank you. Um, good evening. Nyane Gavaru Paruski. I'm uh, very sorry. Uh, before we start with my talk, I want to show you a two minute long video uh, from the Music Center in Los Angeles. They, um, I'm sort of here on their mission. Um, this is not what the talk is going to be about. Um, when you hear, hopefully, what the talk is going to be about, you hopefully will see how I'm hoping to change the architecture of this building. This is a very old-fashioned cultural institution in the United States. Two minutes and nine seconds. Rachel Moore, the president and CEO of the Music Center. This is LA's world-class performing arts center. Welcome to the Music Center.
I hope you won't tell them that we just used that music from the XX. I cannot imagine that they actually got the rights for it. Um, the models of cultural institutions in the United States, where I come from, go exclusively back to Europe and have roots in the Greek antique era and predominantly in the European Renaissance, the Baroque Age, and the Romantic period. They were the results of a single cultural narrative as the countries and societies that gave birth to them were racially mostly unified and immigration was small, although the migration of artists and ideas gave birth to the greatest cultural achievements and they did not all have to be as brutal as the abduction of the Venetian mirror makers by Louis XIV to build the mirror room in Versailles. I admire Russian culture and artists, but know too little about its cultural institutions and their origins, but would assume they also lie largely in feudal systems and singular social and cultural narratives. Societies in the Western Hemisphere, especially in the US, but also in Europe, are getting increasingly multicultural. Immigration of people seem to outnumber by far the, migra the migration of ideas. Our cultural institutions reflect and serve less and less the societies that they should be part of, which has led to an institutional crisis and the need to find new models. My following thoughts are trying to trace the origins of human creative culture and the evolution of cultural institutions as homes of culture, where these might have taken the wrong evolutionary turns, and how we can imagine a radically different model that reflects the societies that we find ourselves living in. This radically different model I have not only expressed in words for this talk, but in 2016, during the 10th anniversary of the Luminato Festival in Toronto, a citywide annual multi-arts festival that I was leading artistically, comparable in size to festivals such as the Edinburgh International Festival, the Sydney Festival, or the Manchester International Festival, we have created a live proposal for this kind of new institutional model by building temporarily the largest cultural institution in the world that was three times the size of the Tate Modern in London. It could have housed the Statue of Liberty upright in it and followed a radically new set of institutional rules. I'm a strong believer that culture and art is not a result of larger complex societies and communities but larger and complex societies are a result of our unique ability to create art and, and express ourselves artistically. Only barbarians destroy art. The below thoughts offer a cross-section of thoughts and ideas that are unfolded in greater detail in a book called Into the Culture Cave that has just come out, although not in Russia. Um, a recent expedition into the caves of Chauvet in the Ardèche department of southern France revealed that visual artists emerged from the earliest human beings and communities about 35,000 to 40,000 years ago, many years earlier than scientists previously thought. Older examples of wall paintings might have existed, but have not withstood erosion and other natural influences over the millennia. Interestingly enough, cave art, including musical instruments made out of vulture or mammoth bones, seems to, have emer seems to have emerged around the same time 40,000 years ago in a completely different region of the world, in Sulawesi in Indonesia, as well as the Arnhem Land and the Northern Territories of um, Australia. Homo sapiens migrated from Africa to Europe about 100,000 years ago. Research shows that larger human communities seem to have developed throughout Europe at the same time as these paintings in the caves of Chauvet in the south of France were made. This could suggest that through the arts, communities were able to form as the arts offer a common spiritual platform, a reason for gathering, a way of interpreting, and therefore abstracting yourself from the world that make communal living possible. During those days, our ancestors shared the European stage with other homonyms, namely Neanderthals. Scientists believe that Neanderthals produced little to no art, at least none significantly that would have lasted until today. In terms of all other things that seem to differ differentiate us from the animal kingdom, such as building fires, cooking clothing ourselves, cooking, sorry, clothing ourselves, or creating tools, all the human species 
seem to have been pretty much the same. None of them survived, except for our species. None of them, except for us, painted or made music. Since Jane Goodall filmed chimpanzees using sticks to repeatedly poke out ants from a hole in the earth and teaching the skill to their offspring, we know today that animals also use tools, long believed to be the differentiator between humans and other species. Then it was maintained that animals don't have consciousness. They don't have an experience of self. That wall has come crashing down as well. Animals do have consciousness. They can even recognize themselves in a mirror. Kathy, the main dolphin from the, U from the 60s TV series, US 60s TV series Flipper, I don't know, was that something that came in, you had in Russia as well? No? Well, this is a TV series that's the friendship between this boy and Flipper, a dolphin. And um, Flipper was actually played um, by a female dolphin called Kathy. Kathy could distinguish herself on the screen from her other female substars or stand ins Susie, Patty, and Squirt. So Flipper wasn't, Kathy wasn't in every scene. She was substituted by other um, uh, Flippers, and she is and she could basically see herself on TV. She would react when she was on TV, but not when the others were on TV. She also clearly knew that it was not her on the screen who performed Flipper's famous tail dance, seemingly standing on the water, but a male dolphin, Scotty, who was brought in to perform the trick, because only male dolphins actually can do this trick. Kathy wasn't impressed when she saw that dolphin on the screen. She would react to the scenes on a TV screen that was propped up close to her water basin where she lived. She showed no interest when Susie, Patty, Squirt, and Scotty were pretending to be Kathy. When it was actually Pat, uh, her on the screen, she got excited and made noise. I doubt that any of the millions of TV viewers saw the difference between Kathy, Susie, Patty, Squirt, and Scotty, but Kathy did. Kathy, by the way, committed suicide later in her career. It is doubtful she did it because she was depressed, depressed over the carelessness and lack of continuity that her character was treated with. She stopped breathing and sank to the floor of her small enclosed water space. Dolphins breathe consciously, we don't. Mythologically and culturally, consciousness is something that is exclusive to man, but biologically it clearly is not. The cave paintings in Chauvet are said to have ritualistic meaning. Neurologists have suggested that movement creates consciousness, implying that all creatures that roam freely develop a consciousness. You have to experience yourself in relationship to a changing environment. You have to react. Communication starts. The I is born. Although, of course, the I of a crab is different from I think, therefore I am, of human beings. Recent studies have shown that even plants have a very sophisticated way of communicating with each other. The great Portuguese-American neuro neuroscientist Antonio Damasio even went so far as thinking about the possibility of plants who move towards sunlight, climbing plants who grow towards an obstacle, or beech tree branches rooting out once they touch the ground to have consciousness as they technically move and react to their environment. Stunningly enough, some plants have thousands of different chemical substances with which they communicate with other examples of their species and their environment. The average human vocabulary is significantly lower. Now, of course, one will argue that this is not necessarily language, but merely chemical processes that are triggered by certain impulses and therefore lead to certain chemical reactions. Although on a neuro, neuronal, neuronal level, that is probably very similar to what happens in our brains as well. The sophistication of whale sounds and languages, as well as those of many other species, are just beginning to be grasped. So what is the last bastion that only human beings are capable of inhabiting? What is it that no other living creature or substance has ever produced? In my opinion, it is art. Only we have created works of art that shift living organisms' relationship to nature from survival, which is what most species are after, to living from something 
that is created solely for the purpose of surviving and procreating to something that has an additional meaning which we might call spiritual or metaphysical and which creates ritual or gathering. Yes, chimpanzees and, so, and zoos who definitely have rituals and form social communities based on characters and individuality have been known to produce paintings if you put a canvas in front of them and dip a paintbrush into paint and put it into their hands. But there is no evidence that after they created them, they treated these paintings any differently than any other objects. They would not gaze at them as we gaze as, at the oldest cave paintings or gaze at John Singer Sargent's Madame X. They would not regard their destruction as cruel. I would assume that our ancestors from 40,000 years ago would walk into the Metropolitan Museum in New York or the Tretyakov Gallery here in Russia and would see a direct line from their ochre, charcoal, and bone and calcite cave paintings to these oil on canvas ones. Art forms ritual and ritual forms community. Art is not a result of human existence or of the survival of our species. It is not something that came at a later point in our development as we became more sophisticated in terms of organizing our food supply, protecting ourselves from the environment and communicating better, and had some free time on our hands. But it is right there at our origin, at our independence and success as the only human species to continue living through the millennia. It is what distinguished us from the Neanderthals or any other human species before us, from any animal or plant that has ever survived and existed on the planet and probably will. It made us distinct from all living matter. We became superior in interpreting the world and the cosmos. Religion was born, science came later. Through art, we are able to give life a meaning we're able to form larger communities that make us stronger. It is an evolutionary step that has nothing to do with the body of the animal that is undergoing evolution, adapting in a more ideal way to the environment by making hands larger, beaks thinner, or the fur color more invisible in its environment. Evolution steps outside of the body through art. We know that art was produced even earlier than 40,000 years ago. We have records of simple abstract forms and patterns scratched into the rocks. But even earlier forms might have been drawn into sand that the winds blew away, sticks arranged on rocks. There might have been dancing, chanting, singing, and clapping. Performance, or any time-based art, art that is only created to last for a certain amount of time, is probably even older than painting or sculpture. And if not, we do know that they existed around the same time as the paintings were created. We can assume that art was connected to rituals for thousands of years. It was intrinsically part of our ancestors' lives. The oldest musical instrument known to mankind is a flute at the very top, made about 35,000 years ago out of the bones of a vulture whose descendants still roam our planet more or less unchanged today. It was found in a cave it is believed that the possession of these instruments gave our ancestors a strategic advantage over Neanderthals, for example. They couldn't communicate via long distances without necessarily revealing their identity or where they were. The sound of the flute could mimic nature, understandable to those who were communicating with each other but not to others, the earliest form of cryptology. Ian Tattersall, a paleoanthropologist and former curator at the Museum of Natural History in New York writes, quote, the tradition of European cave art began almost exactly coincident with the arrival of Homo sapiens in the subcontinent. That arrival also presaged the disappearance of the resident Homo neanderthalensis, a large-brained hominid species with deep roots in Western Eurasia. New genomic information suggests that there was some minor intermixing between the two species. But although the Neanderthals may thus have contributed a few genes to the modern human genome, they rapidly became extinct as a distinctive anatomi ana anatomical entity. The exact reasons for Neanderthal disappearance are unknown. 
Most plausibly, they mainly involve competition between the two species for economic resources. Though given what we know historically of human behavior, it seems unlikely that there was no direct conflict, end quote. Homo sapiens lived in larger groups of people and could probably overpower and outsmart the smaller groups of Neanderthals and kill them for the resources. So art also creates wars, which history has unfortunately proven to be true over and over again. Neanderthals disappeared the moment art appeared. I doubt this is a coincidence. The Neolithic caves are the earliest form of permanent human shelter. It is literally a roof over your head, even though our ancestors would not yet settle down permanently in them and abandon their nomadic lifestyle. They simply could not afford to do that as they had to follow animals and the fruit, roots, and other plant material that, be that became available for consumption at different times of the year in different locations. But they used caves regularly and repeatedly. They came back to the ones that they painted. The cave, as well as being used as a human shelter, as a place for gathering and manufacturing, was also our first gallery, concert hall, and theater. This Neolithic multidisciplinary and mixed-use concept is the foundation of the idea for the culture cave. The existence of the Neolithic cave is the model for the cultural institution of the 21st century. Our cultural institutions today are incredibly varied in size, shape, and form. From a community theater and center in Yellowknife in the Northern Territories to the Metropolitan Opera in New York, the Zahadit Designed Opera House in Guangzhou, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, the Foster and Partner Master Plan West Kowloon Cultural District in Hong Kong, to the Holocaust Museum in Berlin. We have designed and built contemporary art museums, shoe museums, train museums, war museums, Holocaust museums, experimental theaters, Broadway theaters, opera houses, ballet theaters, children's libraries, rock venues, jazz clubs, arenas, the list is endless. But they have all one thing in common. The genesis of our cultural institutions of today can be traced back a few hundred years ago, and since then, nothing in their structure has significantly, has significantly changed, even though our societies, our religious beliefs, our economies have. Louis XIV would still intuitively know where his place would be in the Snow Heta designed opera house in Oslo, in the center of the first balcony, exactly where the king and queen of Norway are sitting today. Most of our cultural institutions were invented during the Renaissance and the feudal and aristocratic period in Europe. Of course, many new ones have been built by every generation, but all followed the old models. While 400 years ago, there were no separate museums for chairs, design, ceramics, modern art, contemporary art, the DNA of the museum, of the theater of today, essentially is still the same. Around the same time that the ancestors of today's cultural institutions were born, ritual was disconnected from art, thus losing its central role in our lives. Art was put into places that were specifically designed for it. Applied art was, separate from, was separated from fine art. By seemingly giving it its own space, by creating art for art's sake, we have inadvertently banned it from the center of our lives, cutting its roots and leaving it to slowly die. Europe and the Western world is currently in its most recent phase of colonialism, which is a cultural colonialism. We build European models of cultural organizations all over the world, with Western-style museums and opera houses in China and the Middle East, such as the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi, the Louvre Abu Dhabi, New York, um, New York University Abu Dhabi, and the Dubai Opera House, to name a few recent examples. The Opera House in Manaus, the Teatro Colón, are actual colonial examples of how Europeans ex exported their culture and their forms of cultural organizations across the world, paralyzing the development of any new forms of cultural institutions. Over hundreds of years, not much has changed in the way we preserve and show art. 
Of course, curator curatorial discipline has become more rigorous, conservation as well, lighting and technical stage equipment more sophisticated. But in the most fundamental ways, how the audience interacts with the art, how they experience it, how they consume and access it, nothing has changed, even though our societies have vastly changed. Except for the fact that audiences have to make more and more choices as more and more cultural and creative niches get their own versions of the hundreds of years old model of the museum, the theater, or the concert hall. And as shown above, we continue to build the same models over and over again, just giving them more spectacularly designed skins. But we have hit a point where these niches and disciplines that institutions have caved out are becoming too small, where the institutions cannot react to social changes anymore, just like animals who are too finely adapted to a certain environment will die out with the slightest shift in its microclimate. Today, as opposed to 400 years ago, we separate culture more and more. Everything is in a different place. You cannot go to an exhibition, a concert, a nightclub, and an opera in one day. It is physically not possible. In the old days, the monarch did not even have to leave his palace. Of course, unlike back then, culture is accessible to all people today, although that is somewhat of an illusion as well. One could almost be tempted to say nothing changed fundamentally for 400 years, but things got a lot worse and less convenient. In addition to the fact that a lot of our culture happens in different spaces at the same time, almost 90% of the performing arts start between 7 and 8 p.m. Museums all have more or less the same opening hours. Transportation has become a huge issue in many major cities and people are less willing to leave their neighborhoods. For many New Yorkers, Brooklyn is still almost a different country. For Torontonians, after 6 p.m., when commuters are home, there's hardly any osmosis between the inner city and the suburban areas. In Sao Paulo, the rich commute with helicopters to get from one place within the city to the other. In the highest capital city in the world, La Paz in Bolivia, that stretches over 750 altitudinal meters, people tend to stay within their range of altitudes, with the rich living lower and the poor higher up more oxygen for the rich. If the highways 101 or 405 in Los Angeles are congested, we know at the music center that we might lose a large part of our audience. Most festivals in the world were founded after great crises. Many festivals were founded as a reaction to the cultural devastation of the Second World War and as a symbol of growing national identity. The Prague Spring Festival was founded in 1946 Bregenzer Festspiel in 1946 as well, the Edinburgh Festival in 1947. Others like the Ruhr Triennale and the Manchester International Festival were created to be vehicles of social and economic change in cities that needed to find a new direction of growth in the post-industrial world. A lot of festivals celebrated a post-dictatorial reality in their countries, like Santiago Amil, that was founded in Santiago in Chile a few years after Pinochet stood down, or the Lake of Stars Festival in Malawi less than 10 years after the first multi-party elections were held. The founding of the Luminato Festival in Toronto was a reaction to SARS, a viral epidemic in 2002 and 2003 that basically shut down the city. But even festivals, which are not as bound to institutions and buildings are mostly monothematic and often make use of seasonally, seasonally vacant cultural institutions, thus often giving a more out of the ordinary spin on their product, but not really rethinking the model of how culture and art are presented and consumed and experienced. The upheaval of the late 60s had an effect on how culture was being thought of it led to the construction of new institutions that tried to celebrate a new openness and social and cultural reality. The Centre Pompidou turned the architecture of a, of a museum inside out. The Pompidou was founded to combine different art forms under one roof. The visual arts through the Musée National d'Art Moderne, 
music through Ircom, a brainchild of Pierre Boulez, and the literary arts through the Bibliothèque Publique d'Information. The idea was born almost more out of necessity as all of these institutions needed a new home. One of its main achievements ushered in by its founding director, Pontus Hulton, was that it did not think about projects in a geographically exclusive way. A project by the Centre Pompidou did not necessarily have to take place at the Centre Pompidou. This was a more radical idea in those times than it is today. But even today, artists mostly struggle if they propose a project to an institution completely outside of its building or main location. Holton's decentralized idea was later institutionalized by creating branches in Metz and Maubeuge and later in Malaga in Spain, basically giving birth to the idea of franchising cultural institutions, which has led to Guggenheims or Louvres all over the world. One is led to think that cultural decentralization, as noble as the idea of bringing culture to the people might initially sound, is truly the worst version of cultural imperialism, forcing a culture that does not come from the midst of people onto them. This mistakes a symptom for the cause. The cause is that our institutions are fundamentally wrong in how they preserve and therefore isolate the arts from our lives. At this point, one might also have to make a very deliberate distinction between art and culture. I would say that art is for all people. It is part of a global heritage. It does not necessarily belong to one nation. Therefore, it cannot be destroyed by others. Culture is the collective narrative that we give to art that is shaded by national history and systems of power. Art is universal. Culture is mostly local. Art is timeless. Culture is not. So the colonialization does not come from bringing art from one place to the other, but bringing its set of values, its power structure to the place as well, the context in which this art is placed. What the 60s and 70s then produced was the idea to spread more of the same flawed institutions into so-called underserved regions or neighborhoods. All the satellite institutions of the Pompidou that were built in exactly these regions have given up on the idea of multidisciplinarity, which was the one hopeful new element and which seemed to be so much at the heart of the founding of the original Centre Pompidou in Paris they focused instead only on the visual arts. But even in Paris, the different departments are hardly communicating and are organizationally very much separated. The Pompidou, through its architecture, was supposed to signal a new openness to welcome audiences. One did not need a ticket to enter and experience large parts of the building. The entrance was through the top after going up a large escalator that got rid of the normal idea of the street level lobby that only allowed for a glimpse into the building. Here, you could literally feel on top of the art without even paying. In 2000, the decision was taken that visitors could only enter the spectacular escalators at the Pompidou if one carried a ticket. The Pompidou became a fortress like all the other cultural institutions founded by aristocrats before. On the other hand, stepping into the cartoucherie, the home of Ariane Nushkin's Théâtre du Soleil in the outskirts of Paris, is like stepping into a place that is as familiar as home. The great writer, American writer, Anna Devere Smith, described best, in my opinion, what the essence of a cultural institution founded today should be. She said, radical welcome is the main quality that a cultural institution of the future needs to have. A soft radical welcome is how I would describe the cartoucherie. The Théâtre du Soleil found its home in a Baroque bullet and gunpowder factory. The main door to the lobby is very modest and one only really finds it as a bee would find the entrance to her hive. There is a constant trickle of people coming out of and going into a hole in the building. You show your ticket when you pass through th this little opening. The box office is located in a small outbuilding. Once you're inside the cartoucherie, you're one of us. When I went for the first time, I was shocked. Ariane Nushkin herself stood in the door 
and punched our tickets. It wasn't a stunt for just a few minutes. It was every single one of the members of the audience. It is not a surprise she, since she lives about the Grand Hall's entrance. We were coming to her place. Never had I felt so welcomed at a theater. Inside, the lobby looks like a taverna on a marketplace in the late lazy afternoon sun from a Fellini movie. The company has prepared food, mostly soup with or without meat, that tastes simple and delicious and gets served from behind a counter. Towards an area in the back, there is an open space under the bleachers of the theater that is situated in the adjacent hall. There you see the actors getting ready for the show, putting on their costumes, makeups, and wigs. There's no attempt to create the illusion of theater. The artists do not try to hide and only appear on stage in costume and makeup as if they are the real characters that they portray. You see what it takes to get there and how it all comes down. The director, the creator of the theater, is not the invisible god or puppet master behind the stage creation, but a public figure that more or less, like a circus director, greets everyone at the entrance. There's no illusion, no anesthesia, as Bre Brecht might say, but there's so much atmosphere, so much wonderful, stimulating scent and perfume. Another important cultural institution was a product of the social changes of the 60s. The Barbican, although officially opened in 1982, was conceived over a decade earlier as a utopian vision to transform an area in London that was devastated by bombing during the Second World War. Again, culture was supposed to heal the wounds. It was also a new approach in terms of a cultural institution. It was not only a center for the performing arts, but included a gallery, restaurants, public spaces, the Guildhall School of Music, and apartments in one larger cultural complex, all designed by one architectural team in several stages. The Barbican is maybe the one place in the world that comes closest to the concept of the culture cave as a generator for art, emotions, community, and ideas, as it combines living, learning, visual art, and the performing arts. Here, there are, however, distinct spaces for the different art forms with almost no fluidity between them. The school, the library, the theater, the movie theaters, the concert hall, the exhibition space, all are separate entities within the larger complex. They're designed so that visitors can experience one art, from one art form without disturbance. Schedules are not coordinated and do not encourage the attendance of multiple events in one visit. One can summarize the organizational formula of this multi-arts venue as follows. Individual ideas are separated in space and not separated in time. Everything is close by, so it gives a sense of heightened activity, but the diversity can hardly be enjoyed at once. Most performances start around the same time, between seven and eight, which prohibits visitors from meandering between art forms. You have to choose whether you attend a concert, a play, or other performance. The gallery closes at 6 p.m., so you could have, so if you wanted to come, you, you, so you would have to come over two hours earlier to see art and a performance in one day. Cross-pollination, a word that is so abundant and overused on the artistic cre creation side of today, but realized so little, is not encouraged among visitors. The way the Barbican is programmed is geared towards one visit of one event at one time. The audience has to make a choice. Do I go to see a play, or do I go to see a concert, or do I go to see an exhibition or a movie? But the audience cannot do everything at one time. The Barbican solves the problem of bringing all the arts closer together, of creating one destination so there's no commute, but it totally fails to go the final step to actually give the audience the freedom to be able to experience it all during one visit. It clings to the old idea that performances and art need to be presented in autonomous, undisturbed spaces, separate from the outside world, with audiences conditioned not to make noise. The concept of the culture for the culture cave 
is to flip the formula of separation in space and no separation in time on its head. We don't separate in space, we separate in time. There is no institution in the world that has ever attempted this because it is a rule that started with the birth of cultural institutions and has become even more rigorous over the century as the performance space and the exhibition space became more and more segregated and sacred or even hermetic. As mentioned, separation or segmentation is one of the guiding principles of our culture. It is the result of the autocratic, aristocratic leader making the decisions. It is about the individual who does not want to be disturbed during the consumption of art, who wants to experience art in the highest form of refinement possible. And we think we need absolute quiet for that. These institutions force us to attempt to escape the world while consuming art. The culture cave wants you to be in it. A porcelain museum is an institution that is attractive for a very small circle of individuals. The same applies to a print museum, to a design museum. All our cultural institutions are only geared towards small segments of the population. It is not a surprise that cultural institutions are in a crisis because they have segmented their audiences more and more without being inclusive. You cannot have the one without the other. The culture cave is for the people. It is conceived with a heterogeneous, diverse, multi-ethnic, multi-racial, sexually and gender diverse group of people in mind, of varying from none to total cultural sophistication. Our societies are increasingly getting richer in minorities. This is an irreversible movement. The culture cave tries to reflect and incorporate this diversity into its institutional DNA. It is not retrofitting like so many organizations of today are attempting in order to stay relevant. Unlike all other Western cultural institutions, the culture cave is not conceived with the idea of one ideal visitor in mind. For the Salzburg Festival, for example, the ideal visitor would be someone like the former German president, um, Richard von Weizsäcker, an incredibly sophisticated, well-read, and educated cultural person. For the Manchester International Festival, it'd be, it would be someone like Caroline Vreeland, a tastemaker. They only appear if something is cool or is of a certain zeitgeist. They are not bound to any art form or other forms of entertainment. It just has to be hip, new, and cool. For the opera, the ideal visitor is still the monarch. There's no single way of experiencing the cultural cave in one visit, as it is not geared toward an, an ideal visitor, and there are multiple choices that a visitor can make at any given time. At all other cultural, venue, vi at all other cultural institutions, visitors have to make one choice and then stick to it, otherwise the visit ends. How can this idea look like in reality? The Hearn Generating Station is a unique industrial ruin in the world. It is situated on Lake Ontario in Toronto, about seven minutes from downtown Toronto. It is three times larger than the Tate Modern. It is larger than the Colosseum in Rome, larger than Lincoln Center, MoMA, the Brooklyn Academy of Music, and the New York Public Library combined. It sits on Toronto's waterfront in very close proximity to downtown Toronto in a gigantic industrial wasteland in a city that is one of the fastest growing and most multicultural cities in the world. Its smokestack is the only other structure in Toronto apart from the CN Tower that you see from across the lake on good days. For decades, nobody from the public has ever been there. There are probably very similar topographic and geographic reasons why we chose the Hearn today as a location for making and showing art and why our ancestors chose the caves of Chauvet to make some of their most beautiful works of art. The Hearn is an ideal location to try out the concept of the culture cave of art and culture without spatial separation, just separation and time. It is a gigantic structure that is of an, of an overwhelming post-industrial beauty. Its decayed beauty is a bonus, but certainly not integral to the concept of the culture cave. 
There's a gigantic difference between the idea of the culture cave and places like the Armory in New York or the Jahrhunderthalle in Bochum. They stage their spaces as spectacular backdrops to their programs and make their space the main player. They treat the space like a new building. And in most cases, what they do in these buildings are old ideas artistically and institutionally. The backdrop makes them appear new. The culture cave is not about a seductive surface, but it is about a giant empty volume. The Hearn is a space the like hardly anyone has ever set a foot in. It's so big that space actually never became an issue in the conception of what we were trying to do there. We always had more space than we needed. We could build a 1,200 seat theater, a 2,000 seat concert space <coughs> that turned into 5,000 standing room music stage, multiple galleries, workout spaces, exhibition spaces, community spaces, multiple restaurants, and many more things without running into space problems. In addition to that, it was a space that was not culturally, economically, or ideolo ideologically coded. It was unchartered, unexplored territory. It was a discovery. This abundance of uncoded space is, of course, a luxury in most large, economically prosperous Western cities. It is the determining factor, though, in moving most of the cities great cities in the world forward. Soho in the 60s in New York is an example which let artists live and work in abandoned manufacturing buildings or the post-wall Berlin of the 90s which basically overnight opened up massive amounts of abandoned and empty spaces in suddenly the most central parts of town. It is one of the secrets that developers and city planners <coughs> do not understand that artists do not like developed spaces. You cannot build space for artists, they build it themselves. Towards the end of the first decade of its, of its existence, Luminato seemed to, the Luminato Festival seemed to reach puberty and its true shape started to form more definitively. It was about adventurous art and ideas in adventurous spaces. What the festival was best at was setting its audiences off on a mental adventure through the artistic projects that it presented or created. But secondly, also on a physical adventure on discovery or rediscovery of the city through the arts. While the festivals like Salzburg have very established venues, Luminato was at its best and most precise when it discovered new places and occupied territory that had not been touched by art. An early concept of the festival was to spread across the city, to engage and partner with as many communities and other arts organizations in the city. The founding idea of the festival was to change the way people saw Toronto by being present everywhere in the city. Unfortunately, it is a myth that festivals can change how people experience a city the size of a major metropolis such as Toronto, New York, Sydney, Paris, Moscow, or Hong Kong. The Greek invented festivals in Europe. One of the earliest ones was the Dionysia, which consisted of two parts, one in the countryside and one in the city. The festival started out in the more rural part, which seized its independence to the Athenian Republic, which then imported the festival into its capital. For the urban part, all citizen, mostly men, the presence of women at these festivals is still under debate, had to attend the performances of tragedies and satire plays that were written for the festivals each year. Cultural life had taken over everyday life for five days. This would be impossible today. The rural Dionysia was more of a pageantry with reenactments of the arrival of Dionysus, wine and singing contests. Plays that were premiered at the city Dionysia the year before were sometimes re-performed in, in the countryside. Even the Greeks knew that in order for a festival to take over the life of a city like Athens, you have to make attendance compulsory. Otherwise, it is better to do one in a smaller city where you have to travel to attend and lose your mind. It would be a dream to send every citizen of Toronto to the festival, but probably an unrealistic one. The festivals that take over the town, this happens in places like Salzburg, Glastonbury, Spoleto, Coachella, 
the idea to radically change the entire mental and physical geography of the Luminato Festival to reverse the motion of spreading out into the city into the opposite direction of concentrating everything into one location at the Hearn Generating Station came in October of 2015. <coughs> it solved a large number of problems and questions in one go. First of all, we had created the ultimate adventurous space and therefore found the purest expression of the festival's DNA. Nobody had ever been at the Hearn before. A few movies were shot there using the Hearn mostly as a futuristic or ap ap apocalyptic set. <coughs> Families of raccoons, <coughs> something we actually struggled with during the uh, festival as they seem to truly enjoy drinking, drinking theater of fake blood. Apparently a family of coyotes and a falcon lived there, but families with, with kids and their grandparents had not had access to the Hearn since it was decommissioned in the 80s. Will anyone come? How are people going to get there? These were the most common suspicious questions we received. Having one's own venue meant that the festival had total control over the audience experience. We did not need to work with anyone else's front of house team, but there was also nothing to rely on, no built-in audience. The 2016 Luminato Festival at the Hearn can be understood as a sketch or blueprint to the idea of the culture cave, the concept of the cultural institution of the 21st century that goes back to the first permanent human shelter and artistic space where art gives birth to community. The Hearn was alive for 17 days, whereas hopefully the culture cave will become a permanent living reality at some point in the future. Three inspirations that shaped the realization of the Luminato Festival at the Hearn Generating Station and are also essential to the idea of the culture cave are one, Jane Jacobs' dogma that new ideas must use old buildings. Jane Jacobs is an American uh, uh, sociologist who basically saved uh, downtown, uh, saved New York from uh, superhighways that were going to destroy downtown and neighborhoods uh, in the Greenwich Village. Two, Ariane Mushkin's hierarchy-free theater company, Théâtre du Soleil, that I talked about before. And three, Cedric Price's and Joan Littlewood's Fun Palace, thinking about architecture in terms of process <coughs> and events in time rather than objects in space. Openness was the guiding principle that was applied to the architecture, to the audience, to the program, to the institution itself. The culture cave is a space without walls. The audience is constantly aware of everything that is happening in this space. At the Hearn Generating Station, the space was always open. Even though a performance was going on, audience members could come in and walk freely in this space, visit the exhibitions, or go to the restaurant. One could compare it to how people navigate their computer and online access, having multiple windows open at all times, meandering back and forth between them, listening to video on YouTube while writing a text and chatting with friends. Joni Mitchell said in an interview that as a child, her teachers criticized her for always coloring across the edges. This is what the culture cave does. It colors across the edges. It smears the boundaries. It creates a bit of a glorified chaos. It is difficult to, to explain this to artists who are used to performing in silence or having their work exhibited in white, finite spaces. Some artists weren't ready for it. Others almost canceled and then felt once there, it was the space their work was meant to be seen in. In essence, it is what art is about. Art is about transgression and transcendence, crossing human, behavioral, physical, spiritual, and mental borders, repeatedly telling a different story about who we are in our environment, taking us out of the world and putting us into a different way, thus asking the question about our place in the world and in the cosmos over and over again and giving it ever new answers. This approach can already be observed in the earliest art known to us. It puts us in perspective with nature, which immediately, of course, also cuts us loose from nature as independent thinking beings. Therefore, progression and development can happen. 
Art is not about locking up works in a white cube or a soundproof concert hall and, basing force and basically forcing the audience to suppress their bodies. If we want to make culture an essential part of people's lives in a multicultural society where it is impossible to indoctrinate people with the single narrative of what a co country's culture should be, it is necessary to open up our institutions and let people understand that they are welcome all the time. Regular cultural institutions function like a binary code. You're either on or you're off. You're in or you're out. You go to a museum to see an exhibition. You go to a theater to see a show and you leave. There's not much else to do. The minute you enter the front lobby, you're on. You're in the experience. That is terrifying for a lot of people, just like it is terrifying for a lot of people to walk into a high-end luxury store just to browse, because sure enough, after 10 seconds, some far too well dressed for his or her salary shop assistant comes up to you and asks you if there's anything particular that you're looking for. If you are that person walking into the store and it is obvious that you have never even worn any of the brand's clothing, I would ever buy any of their articles, that experience gets even more frightening. Normal cultural institutions are like those stores. You are immediately confronted with everything inside, and a lot of people are not able or willing to expose themselves to that kind of an attack. At the Hearn, entering into the building, into the cultural space, was gradual and without any obstacles. You could partake as little or as much as you wanted. You knew it was always there, but it was never imposing itself. You had a choice, and, what it, and it was not about high or low art, loud or quiet, big or small, intellectual or not, uplifting or exhausting. It was all these things. While above it is made clear that the idea of the culture cave is one about openness to the people that is aimed at tearing down cultural and artistic barriers, the institution in itself also has to exercise openness and actually function as a host to other institutions. It is about creating a meeting place for audiences and artists. It should also be a meeting place for other institutions of all kinds. This was practiced at the Hearn Generating Station in a very dedicated way. Over 25 other Torontonian cultural community and entertainment institution, institutions were invited to present their own program under their own institutional banner inside the Hearn Generating Station. These ranged from students from OCAD, Ontario College for Art and Design, to established entities such as the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, Yes, Yes, You All, a queer hip-hop multi-ethnic dance party, to Monkey Vault, a parkour workout studio offering special classes at the Hearn, to Joe Beef, my favorite Canadian restaurant, and Team FX, a group of Canadian base jumpers throwing themselves off the 900-foot high smokestack on opening night. So the Hearn actually addressed for the first time the idea of collaboration with other institutions and groups in the city in a much more comprehensive way than could have been achieved in previous years. A queer Iranian-Canadian youth coming for a dance party would not go to a play about Scottish kings from the 15th century. But these two events were back to back in the same space and the different audiences crisscrossed while coming and going, some seduced to stay on, interested to see what happens next. They were all in the same space, whereas in the world, their path would never cross. Over half of the 100,000 people people who attended the entire festival did not buy a ticket for a particular event, but came to see the free exhibitions and the space. This openness needs to be constantly pushed further and further for the institution to stay vibrant and relevant. In a time where shopping malls purchase theater production companies as they understand that they need to bring in arts and culture to stay relevant, we have to constantly expand the inclusiveness of the culture cave. We certainly cannot lose the fight for survival of the arts and culture to shopping malls. The culture cave is all about seduction, seducing people to cross lines 
as they, that they did not cross before. Lines are made invisible in the culture cave. At the Hearn, we've only scraped the surface. So much more can be done to create a true gathering place for people around the arts. There were a lot of ideas that remained unrealized. A campground was supposed to allow people to actually live at the Hearn Generating Station for the duration of the festival. Just like our ancestors would have temporarily cooked, slept, and lived in the entrances to the caves. Sports and physical activity, in addition to cultural activity, could have been explored more. Conceptually, it was alluded to with the inclusion of the parkour workout courses that were offered and sold, throughout, sold out throughout the run. Openness also means that the way the culture cave is activated, the way different spaces are used, needs to change all the time. It is a space that is permanently temporary. The culture cave has to be an institution that incorporates all forms of human activity. Bridging the gap between sports and culture is almost impossible as the spatial needs are different, but mostly as they are just so different in our minds because history has separated our body from our mind over centuries. At the Hearn, due to the massive dimensions of the building, it would be possible to, com to combine these two. Gigantic climbing walls designed or decorated by artists could be constructed. Roller or ice skating rinks could be built next to the theater and adjacent to galleries. Letting parents drop off their kids at the rink while going to an exhibition or vice versa, the culture cave is the first institution that serves the mind as well as the body. A school should be housed in the culture cave, building a curriculum out of the activities of the cave itself, not separating educa education from what is being taught. The culture cave is the anti-Bilbao. The Guggenheim Bilbao feels like the architectural expression of Hans Christian Andersen's The Emperor's New Clothes. It gives a very old idea new life, a new dress, but ultimately it just creates a different armor around what is inside. Nothing has changed. It is a new opiate to make us forget that museums are still the vaults of aristocratic rulers. Today, they are just called patrons. The culture cave is not about architecture. Caves are not about architecture. They were built by nature without design. Yet they are breathtaking, elegant, and beautiful. They weren't engineered, yet they are gigantic, stable, and impressive. The Hearn today is a building that transformed itself through decay. It became open for interpretation. Any construction measures that lead to a greater permanence of the building must not be of architectural or design nature. Architecture and design calcify space. They make it impossible to interpret space in a different way, to change it, to let it artistically rot, build up, or blossom. Cedric Price describes the Fun Palace as architecture in time and not in space, as process. This was radical when he proposed it, although never realized, his drawings reveal that he imagined an architectural toolkit for the inside, a matrix of elements that could be moved and reconfigured. He wanted to play God. He wanted to create the building blocks for us to create worlds with. After playing with it for a time, he would have become limit it would have become limiting and boring, just like a child moves on from wooden blocks and Lego to other more refined toys, products, and lastly, ideas. Temporary spaces have the longest life. An artist starts with emptiness and therefore that is how we start at the culture cave. In order to get a step further from the fun palace to the culture cave, we have to take away the toolkit that Price installed in the space. We cannot predetermine anything. Movement and change can only come from total emptiness and stillness. The culture cave is a shell. It does not have a program. It does not offer a toolkit. It does not offer a grid or a framework. It is absolutely empty and therefore can be refilled constantly. American entomologist and biologist E.O. Wilson said, quote, the real problem of humanity is the following. We have paleolithic emotions, 
medieval institutions and godlike technology. On a current world political end quote, on a current world, world political level, that might be absolutely true and easily understandable. The idea for some world leaders to be capable of launching nuclear weapons, cyber attacks, gas attacks, or biological warfare at the whim of a movement of a finger, at the whim of their motion, is absolutely frightening. If what Wilson says is true, I would say, though, that the real problem is that we have forgotten our Paleolithic roots and don't do enough for our Paleolithic emotions. We have created a world of full of institutions and technology that does not leave us room for these experiences anymore, for a Paleolithic approach to nature and community that would let us incorporate our creator-like inventions into our emotional tapestry. The culture cave could be a space where these three sides of our existence are brought together. It is exactly the amalgamation of the aspects of the problem in one space which might solve the problem. Architects dreamt and continue to dream of creating performative, kinetic, or modular architecture, spaces that can be changed and reconfigured by the humans who live there. They do not realize that the best way to achieve this is by not creating architecture at, at all, it is the same misconception that developers and city planners think that they can plan spaces for artists and creative people. They create their own space, and when they have a new idea, they create something radically different, tearing down the old. Architecture is about creating walls, doors, and floors. Ultimately, it is about creating support and shelter for the human body. In order to create a platform to liberate artistic imagination, and give artists the right environment to create, we cannot determine the spaces for them. We cannot make the boundaries for them. They need to do that themselves. So the more we leave them alone, the more we let them seek, the less we rule and build, but let them rule and build, the better. And this is where the two worlds, the outside world of the community and the inside world of the artist come together where the inside of the artist becomes the experience of the community. Because the culture cave, the cultural institution of the 21st century has no walls, artists can build and rule throughout the entire building and community can gather throughout the entire building. Artists and audiences are no longer separate but part of one whole. The artists in the Neolithic era would venture deep down into the caves far away from the entrance, far away from the world, far away from light, to create their astonishing interpretations of nature and life within nature on a grandiose scale. Their people, their tribes, everyone, including their children, would follow into the darkness of the caves to see the world reborn through the eyes of their artists, illuminated by tortures, by torches, by illuminated by torches, that the discovery of making fire allowed them to light up. We can easily imagine today how cavemen and women felt 40,000 years ago seeing these cave paintings for the first time. As we have all stood in front of a work of art, seen a performance, listened to music, and been shaken to our bones. We are still looking at art the same eye, with the same eyes, listening to it with the same ears, smelling it and feeling it with the same senses as our Neolithic ancestors. We have all been at the bottom of that cave. Now we just have to find it again and rebuild it for the 21st century. Thank you very much. If any of you have any questions by now, please feel free to um, raise your hand and thank you so much for such an amazing, um, full of many layers and many stories and, you know, it was, very, it was quite impressive. Thank you very much. Thanks for explaining. So maybe some of you will want to um, 
ask something or say something, please feel free to do so. Anyone? It's always hard straight away. People have to digest a little bit, but but um, maybe we can. Um, uh, maybe we can w I, I just like to show you, because I, I only have sort of static images, I'd like to show you one video of one uh, a project that we did inside the Hearn Generating Station, which sort of you know, shows also a little bit this community aspect and, 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 and bringing people in a different way into this space. It was a video, it was a project that was done not by the festival, but by one of the institutions that we invited. And uh, they basically asked people to come and learn a song to sing with them. And then that song was for like an hour and a half. Canadians are slow learners. Um, and then that song was basically performed uh, by 1,500 people with um, a, a, a well-known singer who uh, basically led sort of singing that song. This was a video that went sort of viral, and some of you might have even already seen it. Um, maybe we can play that um, uh, from the Hearn Generating Station. Um, it's uh, a song that I think you probably know, even though it's, an Amer it's a Canadian, it's a song written by a Canadian artist who just died. Leonard Cohen is his name. Did he come to Moscow on his last big world tour? He never, he didn't? But you've heard of Leonard Cohen, right? Yes? Okay, it's his most famous song, Hallelujah. It's been covered to death by many, many, many people. Here we go. And you just think on your questions, please, okay?
сделать, мне кажется, в Москве. Вот я только что подумал, что на ночь искусств, которую я пока еще продолжаю программировать, мы просто обязаны что-нибудь подобное сделать. Это очень, мне кажется, я думаю, что мы должны это сделать. Я просто сказал, что мы должны это сделать для Я понял это. Какой будет русский эквивалент? Катюша? Выходила на берег Катюша. Подмосковные вечера. Не слышны в саду даже шорохи. Очень черные. Очень черные. Очень черные. Очень черные. Yeah, exactly. So we should we should sing we should sing Hallelujah, I think, because it's such a beautiful song, and everybody loves well, everybody who we love loves Leonard Cohen. Because it's it's also a religious song, and Russia Russia's new religious songs are probably terrible. Where like people, where like the pop singers, you know, addressed to God. That's like something you want to never see and hear again. So, I mean, it's probably it's probably the only religious song that talks explicitly about a sex act, right? I mean, it's, it's a bit strange in that way. Well, well that's, that's why I think we, sh we will be immediately banned out of trying to sing this song here. So, yeah, because like rel whatever religious and sexual, it's the worst combination possible, so. But otherwise, do you, do you have any questions? No, or the culture cave made you so deep inside of it that you, you prefer to stay there and continue there until tomorrow when you can still come and ask a few questions um, as a part of our panel where, where Jorn is going to be talking. So please join us tomorrow. Приходите, пожалуйста, завтра в 8 часов здесь. А, пожалуйста, there is a question. Есть вопрос все-таки. Добрый вечер. Good afternoon. Could you tell me if I want to create a new institution or a new festival? What two key differences I should keep in mind between a traditional institution and a culture cave? To create a culture cave and not just copy the traditional model. You shouldn't differentiate between between any kind of art form, you shouldn't, uh, uh, you should bring in things, you should try to do what you think is exactly the wrong thing to do. One of the things that I try to, that one, of the, one of the things that has always been sort of a, a, you know, a motto for me is try to do the wrong thing within a certain context and then see if that works. And I think it actually does because we, I mean, we, you know, we did, we had, um, workout sessions going on while we had the National Theatre of Scotland play, you know, perform for three hours um, their piece. And ten people were running through the building and uh, jumping up and down uh, um, bars and, and, you know, concrete blocks, etc., etc., doing a workout thing. That's not something that you would ordinarily do in a theatre. But I think it's important to really do the wrong thing so that um, the people who've been left out um, are actually interested in coming. Does that answer your question? It does. All right, thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you so much, Joran, for being such a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant speaker. Thank you.